Okay, let me begin here. Um, well, uh, welcome again to the 21CC uh, webinar. Um, again, this is uh, hosted by 21st Century China Center at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. Um, GPS, of course, is a top-ranked professional school devoted to the study of international affairs, economics, and public policy. We offer a PhD, master's, and bachelor's degrees, and one of them is a China-focused Masters of China, Chinese Economic and Political Affairs, the MCPA program. If you're interested in the program, you can find out more information at gps.ucsd.edu. Uh, my name is Victor Shi, as uh, many of you know, I'm the Home Ulam Chair in China and Pacific Relations and an Associate Professor uh, at GPS in UC San Diego. Um, please, uh, as a reminder, please use the Q&A function uh, on the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. Uh, you can submit these questions uh, during the talk and I will be reading the questions you submit during the Q&A portion uh, of the presentation today, which will be the last 15 to 20 minutes uh, of the hour. Today, we are very delighted to have uh, Dr. Kaiping Chen uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison joining us. Uh, Kaiping is an assistant professor in computational communication at UW Madison uh, in the Department of Life Sciences and Communication. Uh, Kaiping's research employs data science and machine learning methods, as well as um, in person interviews uh, to examine how digital media and technologies affect politicians' accountability to public well being and how deliberative designs can improve the quality of public discourse on controversial and emerging technologies and mitigate the spread of misinformation and misperception. Uh, Kaiping's work is supported by the NSF and were published in flagship journals across the disciplines, including the APSR, uh, Journal of Communication, New Media and Society, PNAS, among other peer review uh, journals. Um, and, you know, obviously she's a very impressive scholar and we're very happy today to have her join us um, to give her a presentation, which is on when national identity meets conspiracy, COVID conspiracy, something that we have to unfortunately still uh, grapple with uh, every single day. Uh, so uh, Kaiping, um, welcome and, and uh, I look forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much, Victor, for the very nice introduction. And thanks for inviting me to share my work with everybody. So I want to say this is an ongoing work, a series of work. My collaborators and I, we are looking into the role of our nationalist narratives in public discussion about conspiracy on social media. And I would really love to hear your feedback about their findings and also some of the other things you would like to see me and my collaborators doing more in future. So now let me share my slides. So there are a variety of science and health misinformation spreading on social media in the recent decade. So from discussing controversial science issues such as whether GMO is safe to eat, to influencers promoting alternative ways of practicing well-being, and to the very recent COVID-19 conspiracy regarding there have been ongoing debates about whether between the US and China regarding who invented the coronavirus. So parallel with the spread of misinformation and conspiracy is the persistence of nationalist narratives on a global scale. So from the World War I to the present. So nationalism is a very complex concept. So it includes not only about one's in-group pride for one's country, but also a lot of the language in terms of bias and degradation toward outgroups. And also nationalism can be grounded in many different identities, ethnicity, civic nationalism, and a culture. So a lot of the scholars, they, when they study nationalism, they ask survey questions 
about people's attitude to measure their scale, degree of nationalism. But there are recent approach where it's the one I take is to look at the use of identity cues regarding national identity cues in what people discuss on social media. So looking into identity politics and the spread of misinformation in terms of the Sino-US context, here is a figure I wanna show you where we tracked the volume of those originally crafted COVID-19 conspiracy posts on Weibo from the very early months in 2020. So the y-axis here you see represents the volume of conspiracy and the debunking posts. So conspiracy is a red line and the debunking is the black line in this graph. So what we observed is there are several bursts for conspiracy and the debunking, their volume increased. So we further investigated what happened around those bursting moments. So this is where we found that these are also the times where the politicians in both countries went into tensions to debate a lot of political, geopolitical issues, or sometimes they made a gesture to reduce the tension between the countries. So this is where we see that a lot of the conspiracy discussions is situated in the geopolitical discussion between the US and China. So for my research, I brought these two key concepts together to examine how nationalism narratives might shape people's discourse and engagement with science misinformation on social media. So my motivation to bring these two concepts together is those concepts, these two concepts are not only core concepts for social science research, but they have a deep social and a policy implication regarding how different sides view the world and treat and trust each other. So there are many scholarships looking into nationalist attitudes under the political information domain. And they ask people survey questions to look into they are, how does nationalist attitude influence their knowledge about politics, their trust in the government. So there are relatively little research to study the role of nationalism outside the politics, especially in how people demand and process information and misinformation about science. The anecdotal evidence in the recent you know, past two years, they suggest that nationalist narratives might have facilitated the spread of misinformation, such as the label of the calling the coronavirus, the cone flu. However, there are lax works theorizing and empirically testing the relationship between identity politics and a public engagement with misinformation and debunking narratives. So this is where my research is motivated by this big question of what is the role of national identity language in public engagement with science on social media? So I wanna throw up some thoughts here for discussion. So I wanna kind of like discuss with you to think about through my talk is, do you think identity politics is always bad for public discourse? And the second is, how do we think about identity? What does identity, national identity means when we look into in-group versus out-group language in terms of how people view them and engage with them? And the third thing is, how can we make good use of identity politics in the digital economy? So these are the questions I would love to you know, discuss with you. So what is the theoretical you know, theories which drive me to answer this question? So my field is communication. And it is an interdisciplinary field that draws upon theory from social psychology, political science, and computer sciences to understudy, to understand important concepts like identities and the spread of misinformation. So the theory that give me a lot of the guidance to understand the relationship between how will identity language use affect the public participation with conspiracy on social media is the social identity model of the individuation effects is what we call the side model. So this is a you know, very classic theory where the researchers, they point out that in an anonymous environment such as social media platforms, personal identity plays a less influential role in individuals' behavior compared to social identity. 
and in becoming part of a group. Individuals do not lose all sense of self, rather they shift from the personal to the social level of identification. So under this model, when individuals see messages that contain identity language on social media, there are two social psychology mechanisms that can be triggered. One is self-affirmation. The other is the identity protective cognition. So the self-affirmation talks about the psychology of people trying to confirm their own values, which might increase their motivated reasoning of the message. And the identity protective cognition talks about people will downgrade the outgroups because they want to protect their own group's values and views. So these two mechanisms will stimulate individuals to pay attention to engage more with these identity messages. And also might even, they might more likely to use identity language to respond to this social media message. So this is the theoretical framework which guide me to derive a variety of hypotheses I test in my project. So the first hypothesis I look into is regarding conspiracy posts that use in-group and out-group identity language are more likely to receive social media engagement in the terms of number of likes, comments they receive, and also in the depth, the diffusion size, you know, they receive. And then the second hypothesis is, I further look into not only mentioning about identity language, but the use of blame toward the different countries. And then I hypothesis that conspiracy related posts that blame China or other countries, they are also likely to receive more social media engagement. And the third hypothesis I look into is conspiracy posts that use this identity language, they are more likely to receive replies that containing identity language. So this is more about the contagion of identity language in user replies. And finally, what I look into the paper is, I'm looking into the user characteristics and I tested for those users who engage a lot with conspiracy posts that use identity language. They are also more likely to use identity language in their everyday posts beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. So these are the four hypotheses where in my paper, I bring them together to look at how does use of identity language in the original posts, how does that trigger people's social media engagement, not only in the number of likes, comments, but also in how the other users reply to these messages. So I tested this hypothesis in the context of Weibo and I particularly look into the issue of the COVID-19 conspiracy posts, which particularly discuss about the origination of the virus. So for Weibo is the second most popular social media platform in China. So it's with over 500 million monthly active users. So we studied Weibo posts from the user pool of 250 million users. And then we use keywords to collect, to retrieve COVID-19 related posts that were posted from December to April, 2020. And then we filtered into conspiracy related posts that are discussed about COVID-19 origination. So we, this is where we identified around 1500 originally crafted or conspiracy posts that discuss the virus origin. So what we did is we also collected all of the reposts and the replies to these originally crafted messages. And so there are these messages come from around 16,000 Weibo users, unique Weibo users. And we also collected the most recent 500 posts from each user. So this way, we also want to study how these users, what do they talk about beyond COVID-19? So this is where we are also looking to their discussion in their everyday life. So to analyze how identity language is used in this discussion and their impact on public engagement, we used a lot of the computational communication methods. So this is a 
you know, rising sub area in communication as well as in other social science discipline where researchers, they harness social science theories and the big data analytics to study human interaction on digital platforms. So in this paper for the independent variable, we conducted a lot of content analysis on these originally crafted posts regarding whether a post propagate or debunk conspiracy. And do they attribute responsibility to China or do they attribute the responsibility to US or other country? And we also look into the frequency of these posts using in-group and out-group identity language. So just to give you a taste of what the, do we mean by in-group and out-group identity language. So for instance, in-group identity language, such as those posts mentioning motherland, our communist party of China, our country, our Chinese people. And for the out-group identity language, the users will use things called the Occidental, the Western, the white people, American government, American imperialism, foreigners. So these are just some examples where we inductively derive those keywords related to in-group and out-group identity used in this context. And for our dependent variable, this is where we took a multi-model approach to measure digital public engagement. So what do we mean by this multi-model triangulate approach to study public engagement? So we first look into the scale of participation such as for a post, how many likes it received, how many comments it received, how many retweets it received. We also look into the depth of participation, which means how long, how deep these posts received the diffusion in terms of how many people, you know, talk about that over a long length of time. And we also look into users reply because we have all the comments and the reply to the original post. So this is where for the replies, we again apply our in-group, out-group language lexicon to study, oh, for those replies, how frequently do they also use in-group and out-group identity language? So this is our dependent variable. So I would like to share with you some of the interesting findings we have. So first, we found that use of identity language in the original posts is associated with more comments, more likes, and more diffusion they receive. So this is a regression where our independent variable are the use of identity language and also blaming country actors. And for our dependent variable is the number of likes, number of comments, and the diffusion size. So here we run different regression model, which is model one, model two, model three, and we control for a lot of the user level attributes. So what we find here is when a post use identity language, it is more likely to receive likes and a comments and a diffusion. And actually we also found that conspiracy posts when they blame, use blaming country actors, they are also more likely to receive likes and a diffusion, you know, diffusion size. So this is the first thing. What we found is overall, if I post the use identity language, it will become more popular. And then what we look into deeper from this regression model is in the previous model I show you is we just look at identity language as a whole. But what we really want to look at is what about in-group versus out-group language? How do they impact you know, user participation differently? And this is where we found that there is a differential effect comparing in-group versus out-group language on public participation. So this is again, three models where each model, the dependent variable is number of likes, number of comments and a diffusion size. And uh, on each row, what we have is our independent variable such as user attributes. So we plotted some of the user attributes here. And then in the bottom rows where you see is Outgroup the use of outgroup identity language, the use of in-group identity language, and the use of blaming. So this is where, and the line on each plot is the exponential beta. So we run negative binomial model. So it's the exponential beta with the 95% confidence interval, which we show. So the kind of the key thing which we find here is when posts use in-group identity language, 
they are more likely to receive lots, lots of likes, lots of comments, and a, a lot of diffusion. However, when the posts use outgroup identity, so they mention American, American imperialism. So when they mention about outgroup identity, they actually receive fewer likes, fewer comments, and a fewer diffusion size. So this is where we see that it's more like the kind of the short way to put that is if you use in-group, talk about China, then you are more likely to receive participation. But if you mention America, you mention out-group, actually it's the opposite effect. So then we look into the user reply, right? So how does use of identity language in the original post, how do they impact users reply? So this is where we found the contagion of using identity language in users reply. So what do we mean by the contingent of identity communication? So this is where we find that use of identity language in the original posts, they also triggered more frequent use of identity language in all the conversations following the original posts. So this is a graph where, again, each of the model represents our dependent variable. And the dependent variable like in the left figure is how many overall identity language used in replies? And the middle finger, the dependent variable is how many in-group identity language are used in reply? And the right figure is how many out-group identity language are used in the reply? So these are the dependent variable each plot represents. And then each row again is our independent variable. So what we found here is, again, especially when the original posts use the in-group identity language then if we look at the replies they received, those users, they reply with more in-group identity language. They also reply with more out-group identity language. So this means that when you try to talk about, you know, about China, about the Communist Party in your original post, you trigger the more discussion and reply, which use identity language. And again, we don't see that for out-group identity. So if an original post talk about out-group, then it doesn't trigger much discussion you know, in the replies which use identity language. So finally, we also ask, you know, this is just an example I wanna give you about, for instance, this is an original post which talk about you know, SARS is also man-made. It was jointly developed by domestic and foreign deep state forces and launched in China on a large scale. So the purpose is to let the China nation cut off its children and grandchildren until it perishes. Aiming a sharp sword at one's own compatriots, his purpose can be condemned. So this is a way example in our data set. This is the original crafted post. And then what we see is these are all the replies this post received. So people come and say, oh, science, no borders, but the scientists have a motherland. You know, since ancient time, China has the blood of the Book of Changes, and uh, uh, which makes the Chinese civilization continuous, unlike ancient India or ancient Egypt. The Chinese COVID-19 vaccine can be taken, which is totally different from those from other country. So these are the kind of the typical of identity language when we look at the original post and how they trigger this identity discussion in the replies to this original post. So finally, another finding I wanna share with you is, we ask the question of who are those users who engage with this um, conspiracy identity language on Weibo? What do they talk about? Daily life things beyond the COVID-19 time. So this is where we look into all of the 500 recent posts they posted, which are go way beyond the pandemic time. So we look at everything they discuss, not about the COVID-19. So what are, how, how do they, do they tend to also use identity language or not? So this is a finding where on the X axis, we have two group of users. So the no bar represents those users who do not engage with identity language in this COVID-19 discussion. And the yes bar represents those users who engage with this identity language discussion about COVID-19. And the y-axis represents how much in-group identity language they use in their historical post, which is go way beyond the COVID-19 time. And on the right figure, the y-axis represents oh, how many out-group language they use in their daily life discussion. 
And what we see here is for those users who are the yes bar, which means those users who talk a lot about identity during the COVID-19 discussion, they also use more identity language, both in terms of in-group and out-group in their everyday life talking. So these topics are not about COVID-19. These they might talk about food, music, everything else we retrieved from their historical posts. So this is where we see that the nationalist narratives in those users actually go beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. So there is another contagion over beyond the COVID-19 time. So just a summary of what we found. So this is where we summarize our findings as identity communication contagion. So this means that the use of identity languages in the original post, they can trigger more frequent use of identity languages in all the conversations following the original posts. And there are also two nuances to this finding. So the first is the differential effects between in-group and out-group identity language. So it's the in-group language that is contagious. And the out-group, it's actually the opposite effect. And the second nuance is it's the contagion, which is also beyond the COVID-19 time. So users also engage in this type of identity language in their everyday language when they discuss about things on their Weibo. So what are some of the implications of these findings in terms of Sino-US digital communication and informed citizenship in general? How do we develop a more nuanced understanding of identity politics in misinformation studies. So the first is we find that when you cheerleading the in-groups, so this is where they always talk a lot about the in-groups, when you cheerleading the in-groups, it goes contagious on Weibo, not only in how much user participate, but also in users reply. But this doesn't work if you mention the out-group. So one implication for that is we can think about in order to accelerate the engagement of debunking posts, maybe leveraging this type of in-group identity language can attract social media users to engage and spread the correction out. And the second thing is we also found in our paper is use of blame draws more attention on social media, but it could also bring a lot of the negative consequences to inform the citizenship and the trust between the two sides. So this is where we suggest that a lot of the times the media actors and the politicians, they need to adopt more of a positive framing of outgroups instead of a conflict and a competition focused narrative when they try to depict, depict the other country. And finally, we also see that there is a prevalent use of identity language among certain users beyond politics and beyond the COVID-19 time. So this makes us think about that Maybe the use of nationalist language on social media, they can serve as a proxy to identify those people who are more likely to be susceptible to misinformation and a conspiracy and to apply targeted intervention to those users if you want to debunk and correct their misinformation. So these are the things I would like to share with you and I very much look forward for your discussions. Thank you. Oh, wow. What a great uh, topic. And um, I see that uh, questions are building up already. Uh, again, please use the Q&A function at the bottom. So I'm going to start with a couple of very quick questions. Uh, first question is, how do you define uh, when a pose is mentioning a conspiracy theory? Right, so as far as I know, there hasn't been that many good scientific papers on what actually started COVID. Uh, and so you know, even things like, oh, COVID started in the US or something, who knows? I mean, that may not be a conspiracy, you know, after all. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I'd like to know how you define it. The second question I have is, um, so in a way, it, it's kind of difficult for me to think about at least kind of identification issues, because you have two very salient shocks at the same time, right? So one is COVID, you know, very emotional issue, 
people dying, people have to be quarantined, very painful for a lot of people. The other thing is kind of the US-China dynamic. Uh, yeah. One way to think about it is there's been a lot of priming, both in the US and China, but you know, also in China, of hostility against the United States for decades before that, right? So um, the Western hostile for forces uh, and Western imperialists have always referred to the United States. And so people are already very primed kind of against the United States. Then you have COVID. Uh, so it's not surprising to me that, you know, people have this very emotional reaction, you know, when in-group, out-groups are measured, uh, are mentioned. Um, can you do some kind of tests of, you know, either for like a less salient country, you know, a country that does is not so emotionally laden in the Chinese audience, you know, I, I don't know what that would be, maybe Germany, maybe, you know, mm. country like that and whether you see the same effect, right? Because otherwise I think it's very hard to disentangle the emotional just kind of like salience of conspiracy theory involving the US and COVID at the same time. Mm. They're very, very emotional things. Uh, so yeah. that's my other question. Yeah, thank you so much, Victor. You know, these are really two excellent kind of like insights, I wanna say. So the first, the way uh, we define conspiracy. So when we do uh, define, we look into the discussion, we are not looking at every conspiracy we talk about. So we're particularly looking into the conspiracy which discuss about origination. And we look into particularly five types regarding, oh, whether, you know, people talk about it's invented in the Wuhan lab or it's used as bioweapon. And also it talks about 5G causes conspiracy. So these are all the things which are already debunked, fact-checked by organizations you know, in the US and in China regarding, oh, these are rumors. So this is how when we do manual content analysis to look at conspiracy, this is where we draw a lot of these existing sources, which are at that time, think about its defect. And uh, for your second question, I really like, you know, what you mentioned about people already have a lot of emotions, particularly it's COVID. It's the United States. So there is an existing priming effect, right? So there are two ways we currently deal with that. So the first thing is when we're looking to the posts, which, you know, blame other countries, we're looking to not only blaming United States, because a lot of the Weibo posts, they also blame India. They blame, you know, Japan in, in the COVID-19. So this is where when we look at it, when they're not blaming United States, as long as they're blaming some other countries, it's also go viral. So this is, but it's just a data set Majority of the thing, to be honest, when we see blaming, it's on the United States regarding this COVID-19 issue. And uh, the second thing we look into, we control the emotion of, you know, how they, the, the emotional language they used in this, you know, conspiracy post. So this is where we did it with a control variable about emotion. But I would love to do that, you know, some of the things which is not about COVID-19, but still about you know, United States and other countries, I, in my other research, I look into discussion about GMO, um, science forums in China. Again, look into the use of identity language and they not just talk about US, many of them, they talk about Russia, other foreign countries. And this is the way I see that the finding of identity politics, they also trigger more, you know, participation and, uh, you know, identity replies even on those science forums where the audience are more actually science savvy rather than those audience on the Weibo. Yeah. But I would love to look at into it other countries. Yeah. Thank you. Great, um, thanks for these answers. Uh, so we're gonna open it up. Uh, first question uh, from Yang Yang. Uh, when did you conduct the scraping? How does the censorship on Weibo influence your results? Yeah, thank you so much, Yanang, for this excellent question. So, uh, so this is where you know one of my collaborators. So this is a paper where you know some of the collaborators are from the U.S. and some of the collaborators are from the China. So this is where they have a database where they are able to retrieve all the Weibo posts from these 250 million users. And this data set about COVID-19 is already open source. So this is where you know we did this type of scraping. More is not about scraping. It's actually retrieving from the original database. We did that in uh, April, like April, May, 2020. So this is where when we did that. And regarding the issue of censorship, this is where, um, this is an excellent question. This is a question facing 
many of the social media studies in China. And uh, what we see is censorship is a limitation because there are not many people test how censorship work in terms of COVID-19 pandemic. But there are research paper which talk about that, you know, particularly in the early stage of COVID-19, a lot of the discussion about COVID-19 is not actually censored a lot. So this is where, you know, we look into other research to understand how much censorship might work in our place. Well, there's a related question, which is how do you know some of these posts are not generated by 50 cents army mm. bots? Yeah, exactly. That, that's a really excellent question. So this is where, uh, when we look into, so this is the, the short answer is we do not know. And this is an exciting question to study. We want to look into who are those, you know, 10,000 users, who are they? How do we know whether they are 50 cents party or not? But the one thing we have done is we retrieved all of their 500 posts and we're looking into the language pattern of what they say. So we don't know whether they are 50 cents party or not. We wanna know what are the criteria for judging somebody in a 50 cents party. But what we see is they discuss a lot of things which are not politics at all. And they also don't discuss about um, anything related to social issues. They talk about the music, they talk about food. This is where we retrieve their historical posts. And this is where we think one of the next step for us is to really know who those users are from understanding their historical posts. And we are going to think about how we're gonna know, assess who are they in terms of their 50 cents party or government account. Uh, great, yeah, so the next question is, um, how does the sentiment of the post interact with in-group, out-group language effects? So I think I read that as potentially kind of similar to my questions, like do we find that kind of more emotional language also it uses like in-group, out-group? Because that also can, uh, you know, modify some of your results. Yeah, so this is where our first is we also control, you know, for the use of a variety of emotion, positive, negative, different type of emotion as our independent variable. And we do see that for themselves, they also drive more participation. You know, when you use a lot of strong emotional language, but when we look at the effect size, compared to the in-group, out-group identity language. This is where the effect size of those identity language stand out compared to posts who use emotion. We haven't looked into the interaction effects it, but we wanna test that, of course. But the one thing we, the, one of the hypotheses we develop is really about not just mentioning in-group, out-group. We directly look into blaming. So blaming was one kind of emotion. And this is where when we, do content analysis regarding whether a post use blaming on this in-group, out-group. We see that when you use blaming, it drives the traffic. And it also drives many of the you know, uh, comments and the likes, which talks about identity. So this is one aspect of emotion we do look into blaming. But we have a look into the positive, like praising, because the reason is we find many of times it's blaming, not really say positive things. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Pe people just love negative things. That's what I learned. <laughs> yeah, they will debunk the blaming thing. It's, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so the, there's a, uh, another question, which I think is very good. Uh, what is, to what extent the contagion effect is the result of a social network of like-minded users following each other and echoing each other? Mm, yeah, so, yeah, so this is really an excellent question, right? Because you know, when we uh, look into the users, you know, who are those users who engaged with this identity language about conspiracy? When we look at it, this is where we ask, who are they? And what we found is like one of the findings I shared is they also use a lot of the identity language in their everyday posts. So this is where, when we understand about the homophily, you know, one kind of an aspect is, oh, they might be people who just really like, loves to talk about identity. So this is where like, yes, you are right. We see the homophily in terms of that aspect. And also very interesting, we also run, we're not only into looking into identity language in their everyday posts, we also look into other aspects. And we found those users, if you look at what they discuss in everyday life, these users also tend to use a lot of words, swearing words. They also tend to use words which talk about money. That's very interesting. They love to discuss about money. So this is where we began to think about, you know, yes, they might have shared some certain features 
you know, for those people who love just to talk about identity. Yeah, so, I mean, maybe control for that a little bit, um, because, you know, that could also confine, confound the results. Yeah. The other in different pairs is the... Uh, yeah, so at the beginning of your presentation, you show us like these overtime spikes, you know, in discussions of conspiracy theory. Uh, do these spikes, uh, you know, variations over time affect the in-group, out-group language um, that you are measuring? Uh, E.g., for example, before the conspiracy that was virus was originated from the U.S. Army has been come up with. Um, yeah, so any variation over time that you detect. Yeah, so this is an excellent question. So this is actually uh, the graph I first showed in the beginning. It's just a half of the picture, half of the figure. So the other half of the picture where we also look into is how does the use of blaming United States, blaming out group, how does that, the volume of the posts change over time? And when we put these two pictures together, we see that the use of blaming, they actually also increase a lot during those tension times. And the use of blaming actually decreased at the time where the Trump say, let's just not call coronavirus the con flu. Let's not talk about that. So this is where we see the blaming of the United States decrease. So this is where when we pair these two pictures together, we do see that you know, identity language, they go hand in hand. There's no any causal relationship, but it's go hand in hand with the Sino-US tension and how leaders take gesture to release tension. Oh, so you're saying there, well, so actually one very interesting aspect of the paper then is that Chinese internet users actually pay attention to what, what like our president says and stuff, which is, uh, which is pretty, it's quite striking actually. Because... Yeah, this is actually the event which struck them to have a lot of discussion is the, yeah. uh, the China diplomat Zhao Lijian, which is uh -huh. to talk about, oh, the coronavirus probably come from the US military. So this is where it's a top news at that time in March, around the late March. And then this is where Trump come out to say, okay, let's not talk about, let's not call it Kung flu. So this is where it's actually covered a lot, you know, about how the two politicians try to right. debate with each other. Yeah. Wow. And people pay attention, which is really shocking. Because in the US, people just don't pay attention to most things. So unfortunately. Uh, okay, so uh, another question is, how do you define a post that contains both in-group and out-group language? Uh, do you classify it by post? Um, like one post can only get one classification, like in-group language or out-group language? Mm, so this is where, uh, so our, we, this is where we treat it as two different variables. And uh, um, the one, one variable is like for each post we classify, on the post level. And for each post, we calculate the frequency of in-group language. And we also calculate the frequency of out-group language. So it's two separate columns. And it's treated as two separate variables in our data set. And we also run the regression. And we also run the correlation. So it's not about those people who use in-group. They tend to use out-group. It's just the correlation is actually very low between these two variables. So this is where we separate it as two different variables. OK, yeah, or two different like observations almost. Yeah. Right? Uh, okay, and then uh, how robust, um, so you, you have kind of in-group language uh, list of keywords and out-group language keywords. Have you tried how robust your results are if you change the keywords slightly? Uh, so this is where, uh, where we develop this dictionary. It's actually a lot of multiple rounds of process of how we develop these keywords. So this is where like a group of us, we you know, read many of many of the Weibo posts and try to see, oh, what are the, we try to reach a point where there is saturation. And after we develop those dictionary keywords, we also do human validation process to see, oh, if the dictionary say, the post mentioned that a human reader read that, how much do they think it use identity? So we do a lot of the validation, but it's a great idea, you know, to check for a lot of the robustness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's really good uh, advice. We have a project on uh, Chinese analysis of the United States, and I think we can, we'll need to go through procedures like this. Uh, so see someone um, in um, our group here, where do you consider or evaluate self-censorship in the posting? Is there some evidence of self-censorship uh, in discussion of this topic? Uh, yeah, this is really excellent 
point we haven't looked into you know, self censorship in terms of what people discuss because one of the things we think about this issue and when we look into the what people really talk about in COVID-19 they really use those very nasty language they really talk about this conspiracy and many of the times those users actually they debunk those posts so they, the we look at the language they use we, we think that you know we don't know about the extent of self-censorship but we would love to test that in future but from the context we see they are very brave to discuss everything yeah yeah so this is related to also Joe Mean's question and, and uh, mm. question which is that the in-group out-group language is probably correlated with also nasty language or you know uh, very emotional language yeah. things like that and so uh you know do you have a way to sort of control for that to make sure that it's really the in-group, out-group? Or do you, do you see it as like the same thing? You know, it's kind of like, well, you know, of course, when you talk about the United States, you would say imperialist or something, you know, or whatever, uh, or is some, also something very bad or nasty. Um, yeah, do you see those as sort of separate concept and how would you measure nastiness and in-group, out-group sort of separately or together? Yeah, so uh, the way we do that is, are when we talk about emotion, emotion it has many meanings, right? It's not, not only about its nasty or incivility, it also is about different other aspects. So we did, you know, one thing we did is we also ran an emotional analysis on all of the posts in terms of, you know, we again use existing dictionary, like positive, negative, fear, joy, surprise, you know, it's the Chinese kind of like Luke version, Chinese uh, emotional analysis sentiment. And then what we do is, we control, we, we use them as control variables and then see oh, how much effect the in-group and out-group identity has. So we take them as control variables. Yeah. But we haven't played around with the interaction because we don't, there are just so many emotional variables we have and we haven't thought about which way to interact because what we see is the use of blaming. So this is why blaming, we treat it as a totally different variable and we use manual content analysis to identify whether a post use blame or not and which country it blames. Okay, yeah. And uh, we, we have a few more minutes, but can you show us some like larger, maybe descriptive statistics type? There was a question on like, what is the geographical distribution um, of, you know, especially uh, people who want to, you know, discuss things in an in-group, out-group way, uh, over time variation. I noticed there was like the effect of being male but I, I don't know what you mean by male. So in one of the regression tables, you said male was a variable. Is it like the, the person who's tweeting is male, but how would you know that? Or is it something in the content that mm. maleness or something like that? Uh, why was that effect so strong? Yeah, so this is where, you know, we, when we say it is a male or not, this is where our, about the data where the user profile, the user indicate that, you know, whether, the person is a male or female. And there is also those, you know, uh, characteristics like which region the person comes from and whether somebody is a verified mm -hmm. user and which level. So these are all what the user indicate by themselves. So it's their, you know, said reported gender on that graph. And one thing about, you know, who are those users who yeah. uh, discuss with this con conspiracy compared to uh, other users, yeah. So this is where, you know, uh, it's not covered in this paper. So I'm. Well, this is more interesting, you know, don't you think? Yeah. Like, uh, maybe it's just a case of toxic masculine masculinity yet again, you know? Yes. And what we found is, uh, so this is a paper which I post in the Zoom chat. This is where, you know, one of the figure, which is the figure three, we're looking to compare to the average Weibo users. What about those people who engage in conspiracy? Who are they in terms of, we particularly look into user type, we look into user gender and the number of followers they have. So what do we find that compared to the overall Weibo population, men are more likely than women to post conspiracies. So compared to the overall, the like- by the how much? Of by, overall, is it by a massive margin or just like a few percentage point? Uh, so uh, 
It is by a massive margin. Yeah. So this is where, like, for men, this is where when they talk about a conspiracy in this game, it's like, are seventy four percent. But in the Weibo normal distribution, it's fifty seven percent. So it's seventy four percent. You know, wow, okay. it's a huge. and <laughs> yeah. uh, also we see another interesting thing is, uh, there are also more, uh, verified, verified organizational users who actually engage in this conspiracy and debunking game, compared with normal, just you know the the average distribution on Weibo. So in the average distribution, organizational users are only like, uh, eight percent. Uh, are only like 1% are organizational users. But then in this conspiracy discussion, debunking, they are like between seven to 8%. So it's 8% versus 1%. So there are a lot of organizational users who verify themselves as organization. They actually talk a lot in this kind of conspiracy compared to the average distribution of every, you know, Weibo user. Yeah. Oh, right. But the organization will mean kind of government organizations. Right. Or it's anybody who verify themselves as organization. So it could be company, could be media, could be it government. Could be companies, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think that would be interesting to look into. I mean, my hunch is that, yeah, it would be a lot of like, you know, Shen Shen Bu, you know, propaganda departments or Gong Qing Tuan, you know, type things. And then mm. the other thing to look into is, uh, as you know, there's like this all this research on sex ratio. Uh, yes. They distributed. Uh, so this could be. You know, it's a phenomenon that people talk about in the U.S., where you know a lot of people who engage in conspiracy theory and extreme right-wing figures are just like frustrated young men. Um, mm. You know, it could be something similar in China also. Yes, yeah, that that's really fascinating. And what we do see is one very interesting finding we have. You know, in the paper I shared on the chat is yes, men they love to engage in this conspiracy, but then what we see is in the debunking game, so there are a lot of posts which are debunking conspiracy, right? What we found is if you are a woman, you are a woman user, you identify as female, when you debunk something, you actually, you are more likely to drive the, drive the traffic compared to men. So it's kind of like the woman, if you kind of like try to debunk a conspiracy, actually there are more comments, more likes and more shares. And why is that? We're also looking into how those woman users compare those male users where they debunk how do they think things differently? And we found that those male users, they will say something that, oh, they are very assertive. They will say, okay, you are wrong. And this is the correct information. But then the woman users, they will, a lot of them are actually, you know, study abroad students. They will say, you know, this is how I experienced about COVID-19, you know, they will use their personal story to tell things and try to debunk, you know, let's try to be not so political. And this is my experience as a student. So this is where the language are very different. And what's the reaction to that? Is it positive or negative? You say some people would like that, but I would imagine the comments will include some nasty kind of reaction. Uh, for that part, we have a look into the comments session, but it's more yeah. about the scale of participation, like more likes, more comments. Yeah. Right, right. No, this is really fascinating. And, you know, the, the internet um, is a very vibrant place in China. And so there's all kinds of but, you know, underlying socioeconomic factors still matter in shaping a lot of these conversations. I mean, even though the shocks are obviously, it's a nice way of looking at, at the issues uh, because, you know, because COVID in general is a big crisis, right? So I don't know if people are working on this in the U.S., uh, but in the U.S., you know, it was a huge kind of public health and mental crisis for people exactly. isolated and stuff. Uh, given the shock, what kinds of people are going to engage more with extremists or conspiracy related, um, you know, engagement online? I think that's a very interesting question. Exactly, yeah, Victor. So this is why we kind of like looking into not just, let's not just look at COVID-19 time, right? Let's look at those users in their everyday conversation, in all of their discussion about other issues. This is where we really want to understand who are those people? What are their emotional status? We see that they also use a lot of emotional words in their everyday context. You know, for those who engage a lot with conspiracy and they mention money, right? Economic status, mental health. So this is where I think a lot of things when we try to understand, I highly agree with you to understand why people engage in conspiracy, how they engage with these identity politics needs to go beyond the COVID-19. COVID-19 is more like a stimulating factor. They are already historical priming people have in their mind. And this is where you look at the history of their posts. You can learn about who they are and what are their status of the mind. Yeah, exactly. Uh, any other questions from audience? 
Um, if not, then I'll just talk very quickly about our upcoming event. Uh, so uh, we continue to have a lot of events uh, starting with next Monday, starting at four o'clock, uh, we have a joint uh, session with the Atlantic Council uh, featuring Mu Changchun of the People's Bank of China, where we're gonna look, uh, where we're gonna discuss the future of ECNY in China and beyond, followed by a public uh, session, which is um, also on the role of digital currency in the Asia Pacific region. Um, so if you haven't signed up, you can uh, sign up. Uh, maybe Sherry can chat the link <laughs> to everyone. Uh, I, I don't know if it's on our website, but uh, uh, you, you can definitely sign up publicly. Uh, and then on February 17th, um, Michael Davidson, who has a new book, actually a very, very uh, exciting new book on the foundations for a low carbon energy system in China. Uh, he and his co-author are going to talk about their new book. Um, and then on February 24th, we have uh, the growing role of science, technology, and higher education in China's Belt and Road Initiative, um, which will be presented by Dennis Simon from Duke University. So lots of events upcoming. Uh, please join us uh, and sign up. Um, well, let me uh, join, join me in uh, thanking Kaiping for an excellent discussion and presentation. Very interesting work. Uh, a lot more work needed both in China and in the United States on this because these conspiracy theories are not uh, helping anything at all. Uh, and so uh, we look forward to more work uh, from you. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for, for presenting. Yeah, and thank you so much for inviting me. And these are all excellent questions which are gonna motivate my team to do more, to dig more into this and to find solutions you know, for that. Thank Great. you. Yeah, no, we look forward to next uh, iteration and additional papers. The one you posted that uh, looks really interesting. I'm gonna read it uh, as soon as this is over. Thank you. Thank you, Kaiping. Thanks everyone for joining us and see you all next time. <laughs>